Play. The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Uh, beginning. Uh, I'm going to start the countdown. Five, four, three. So, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Justice and Home Affairs Select Committee, continuing our investigation into shoplifting. And we're delighted to uh, have our first uh, couple of witnesses, uh, who I'd be grateful if they could each introduce themselves and the organisations for whom they work. Professor Taylor. Good morning. I'm Professor Emmeline Taylor, Professor of Criminology at City University of London. Uh, and I'm Paul Jarrod. I'm Campaigns, Public Affairs and Board Secretariat Director at the Co-op Group. Thank you both very much. Uh, we're delighted to uh, see you. Uh, I'm going to begin, if I can, by asking uh, a, a couple of questions or so to Professor Taylor, uh, uh, and then um, we'll bring in Mr. Gerard. Uh, Professor Taylor, I, I mean, over the last few weeks, we've seen a huge amount of media coverage about shoplifting. We know that the level of recorded uh, incidents of shoplifting uh, don't represent the true picture because a lot of it goes unrecorded, but nevertheless there has been a huge surge in the amount of recorded incidents of shoplifting uh, and a growing concern by the public uh, that the police are unable to and perhaps not even uh, interested uh, in dealing with this particular issue. Can you just explain to us what your thoughts are about how we've got to this particular situation, what's going on? Yes, absolutely. So you're quite right that um, police recorded incidents of shop theft are at their highest ever level um, since comparable records began in uh, 20, over 20 years ago. In the last 12 months, they've recorded approximately 440,000 incidents of shop theft. It's fair to say that that's a drop in the ocean compared to what the retail sector is experiencing. Um, illustrating that the British Retail Consortium estimate almost 17 million incidents mm. of shop theft. That would suggest less than 3% of shop thefts are currently being reported, um, which creates various issues for the policing. In terms of the um, assessment of how did we get here, that's obviously a, a big question. Um, we can certainly, shop theft is a really useful way to assess the health of a nation because the underlying root causes of it are typically social factors. That might be poverty, it might be homelessness, it might be mental health issues, um, it might be drug addiction, which we know is a huge driver of shop theft. And we know that through the austerity measures for over a decade, have withdrawn vital services required by individuals who might be suffering one or multiple of those factors. Fast forward to the pandemic, then of course that amplified these issues. And so I think the perfect storm has been created and that is why we've, we are now seeing a, what I describe as a tsunami of shop theft across the UK. Thank you very much and we'll pick up on some of that in subsequent questions and of course be very interested to hear what Mr Gerard has to say about your uh, argument that only 3% of uh, actual uh, shop theft, okay. shoplifting is, uh, is actually recorded. But, but interestingly you've used the term shop theft whereas we have called our inquiry one into shop lifting and I wonder if you could just tell us what your understanding is of the difference between shop lifting and shop theft. It's an important point, I think, to look at the vernacular that is used um, around this particular crime type. So theft is defined um, in the Theft Act from 1968 as a dishonest appropriation of property belonging to another with the intention to permanently deprive the other of it. And shoplifting is a form of theft that is covered by that particular 
um, law, but there's some differences into how it's prosecuted and sentenced, and I'd like to draw attention in particular to the introduction uh, um, under the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act of 2014, where it essentially downgraded um, what is now known as shoplifting or low-value shoplifting, um, theft from a shop of goods valued at under £200. So that's where a key difference is. The term shoplifting is used by the Home Office and the police when they record crime to differentiate it from other types of theft and where that might occur. But this word, I think, is unhelpful. I think it still holds connotations of it being trivial, petty, somehow victimless. And so I prefer the term theft from a shop. Um, and then more broadly, that that sits under a category of retail crime, which covers theft, burglary, robbery, violence and abuse, including hate-motivated incidents, vandalism, criminal damage and antisocial behaviour that we're increasingly seeing in the retail space. So, just so I'm clear, if I go into a shop and I steal a tin of beans, uh, in comparison to somebody else who goes into a high-tech store uh, and steals a computer, you're saying that I would, those two crimes would be treated differently? If the value of the computer was less than £200. If it was more than £200. Sorry, if it was more than £200, yeah. mm -hmm. you're correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would be treated differently. And... Is there any difference from the figures that suggest that the police are more interested, take more action, in relation to that second case, the shop theft, the theft of a higher value thing than of lower value things? I think it's, it's important to say that this section, is section 176 of the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act in 2014, was introduced with good intentions. The Sentencing Council identified that over 97% of shop theft incidents are of a value of less than £200. And so the idea was is that the police could deal with these incidents swiftly. The intention was that they could issue fixed penalty notices. But unfortunately, the way that the law was actually then utilised or um, it was a, almost a shorthand, I think, um, usage as to whether the police would then take action. Many offenders that I speak to through the course of my work suggest that they have <coughs> licence to steal so long as they don't surpass the £200 limit. OK, well, I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and if there's more details on those issues you want to write to us about that, I know the committee would find very helpful. Finally, before we move on, um, there's one other area of potential confusion. Uh, I'm, I'm looking, for example, at a, a, an article from the Times newspaper um, quite recently, which is looking into the issues we're concerned about. Uh, and it spends quite a lot of time describing the successes Operation Opal has had in relation to finding uh, examples of shop theft. Um, and a little later on in the article, it describes that Opal is funded by Project Pegasus. And we've been looking in particular at Project Pegasus. So we're a little confused as to the relationship between Operation, uh, between Opal and Operation Pegasus. And I'd be grateful if you could just uh, clarify that for us. Absolutely. That confusion um, that you have is understandable because the article that you reference is incorrect, if that's indeed what it says. So Project Pegasus is a strand of Opal. There were initially five strands to Opal, all dealing with serious organised acquisitive crime. Um, the unit sits, um, it, it's, um, the responsibility of the unit is the National Police Chiefs Council, the MPCC, and Project Pegasus introduced a sixth, a sixth strand um, of serious acquisitive crime, that being organised retail crime. Project Pegasus is, sits under Opal, that is the, the structure of it, and I think moving forward it's easier to actually just refer to Opal um, rather than sort of Pegasus as a, as a separate strand. I think it's evolving in that way that it's now fully subsumed within that structure. Um, Project Pegasus is a collaboration between retailers and the police. It's co-funded, um, so I think more than 15 retailers now um, have committed funds for that to almost be a trial for the first two years to scope the degree of severity of organised criminal networks that are targeting the retail sector across the UK. 
In that case, could you just, I'm sorry to, to go into the detail, but just so I'm clear, if Opal is a, a project that is looking at organized crime, and you then described Pegasus as looking within <laughs> that strand at shop theft, is Pegasus therefore only looking at the element of shop theft or shoplifting that relates to organized crime? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Um, if it's so, the, so, yeah, so Pegasus has come about to specifically look at organised crime within the retail sector. But does that mean that, uh, that Pegasus and the work of Pegasus does not look at the low value crime <laughs> theft in shops? Apologies, I fully understand your question now. Um, so Operation Pegasus and Opal, by extension, have a very clear definition of how they define serious organised acquisitive crime. And a key factor within that definition is that it's a network of individuals who operate across two or more police forces. So they're looking for networks and they're looking for mobility and that cross-jurisdictional activity. So just to be absolutely clear, Pegasus, with its co-funding and all of the arrangements that we understand, does not have an interest in low level the theft of my tin of beans example. Mm. Arguably no, but I imagine that some um, actors within those networks at times may steal from a store to a value that is less than 200 pounds and that particular theft would form part of a series of crimes but they would not specifically look at lower value the, their definition the key definition i think is around that multi-jurisdictional action I, I know we want to pursue that in a bit more detail and turn to wherever she's gone baroness buskin thank you um Quite a depressing start. I mean, when I started my law studies a thousand years ago, I was taught that we were all equal before the law, but clearly we're not. And that's something that the public have become more and more aware of and taken advantage of. I hope you'll agree. Um, we're in a state now where, since the 2000 and around 1617 British Attitudinal Surveys said low level crime. People think low-level crime in this country is absolutely fine as long as it's not of the Philip Green proportions, I think was the terminology. Um, so I want to ask you a bit more uh, to describe, um, as you've begun to, and very clearly, thank you, what we really mean by organised crime. Mm -hmm. What is the 80-20 rule, for example? And the lazy journalism that you referenced recently um, on the BBC Breakfast Show, I call it lazy journalism, where the assumption is that it's all about a low cost of living, and you reference some of the social factors, but actually people are taking advantage in large degree of what they feel is a lawless mm -hmm. situation in our villages, our towns, and our cities. Yes. And then the organised crime are saying, hey, this is ripe for us. Absolutely. I, I agree with that um, synopsis that you've given. Um, I'll first talk to the, um, the, the contribution of around organised um, yes. crime that we're seeing. So just brief, briefly um, referring back to that definition that um, Operation Pegasus uses. Um, so, so a key bit is that there, it's a series of offences impacting on two or more police forces. However, we know that a large proportion of offenders operate within one police force area, and we could refer to them as local prolific offenders, and these are the individuals that shop workers will probably know by sight, so they might even know them by name, they might even know where they reside. Um, but many of these individuals have reached a scale of activity and established pre-arranged networks of buyers or fences um, for the stolen goods that they steal that can only be described as organised, yet they only operate within one police force area. So there's a, there's a difficulty there in terms of the attention that's being given to these different stratums um, of organised criminals. It's very diff difficult to to confidently assess the relative contribution of organised crime, going back to how I started in terms of the chronic underreporting that we have 
um, in this country. So that means that we don't have the visibility around who exactly is committing um, these offences. There has been some estimates, however. So the Centre for Social Justice estimate that 70% of prolific local organised criminals are stealing to fund a drug addiction. Um, so we have some figures there. I think some of the, the, the difficulty around this is going back to that, that the, the definitional um, issues. So, for example, if I may just elaborate with a quick illustration of an individual, um, a drug-affected, prolific offender um, operating in Manchester. He's homeless. He's being housed by a local woman who provides him with accommodation and somewhere for him to safely administer his drugs of choice. Each morning she issues him with a shopping list of goods to go and steal that day. Um, and so he then returns him back to her property. She contacts her established network of buyers, which she found through an online marketplace initially. They in turn are giving her shopping lists for her to then pass on. Um, and just to really show just the, the yeah. scale and severity mm. of this, a typical daily drug addiction bill for somebody is around £300. When you steal property and then sell it on, you typically get a third of that. So they need to steal approximately £900 a day and then have an established network of buyers to shift that, to translate those goods into money to purchase drugs. This can only be described as organised, mm -hmm. but yet it isn't meeting those defi definitional thresholds but that's the the figures that we're looking at that equates to almost half a million pounds a year and that's just one individual operating in manchester can i ask paul if you would like to contribute to this, mm. this part? yeah so, certainly um thank you we've seen over the last year 18 months um in the co-op uh, we run two and a half thousand stores well um, across the country and we supply another five thousand independent stores We've seen crime in our own stores, and the 2,500 go up by 44%. Within that, we've seen a rise of 35% in um, violence and abuse. Okay? Crime, that level of crime is in our stores a 1,000 incidents every single day. Uh, that is the highest level we have ever seen. Levels of abuse are at the highest level we have ever seen. And, and violence is, has dipped slightly in 2024, but it's still at a very high, high level. I think what Emmeline paints there is a really important point, which is that within that, we are not seeing... Uh, there's always been people who have stolen to make ends meet. That's always happened. It continues to happen. You could argue it might happen more in a cost-of-living crisis. Fine. That isn't what is driving a 44% increase. What is driving a 44% increase is people who are stealing to order. Mm -hmm. Huge volumes. People coming into our store with wheelie bins. People coming into our store with builder's bags to steal the entire confection section, the entire spirit section, the entire meat section. And the point about these people, and, and, and Emily has always paints it perfectly, they are stealing to order. If one of my colleagues gets in the way, they, they won't say, oh, sorry, and walk out. There will be a threat. Yes. There, there, there will be a violent threat. There might be a knife. There might be a syringe. I've had colleagues attacked with a medieval mace. We've had colleagues lose their eye. We've had colleagues m mis miscarry. What, what comes with what Emmeline has described is a level of violence, abuse, and threat that nobody in retail, and I've closed even in retail for 40 years, I've ever seen before. Um, and just to paint one last picture of, uh, of this, we have had to move colleagues from their home because they have been followed from the store to their home and threatened at their home. These are people running a store that during the pandemic was the only place people could go. And when we were all told to stay at home and keep safe, my colleagues were in those stores making people sure people could buy food and water. They are, they are being followed home at times and threatened at home. So what, what Emily described is absolutely right. I talk to my colleagues on a weekly basis about this and the stories they tell, I'm, I'm, I'm a former law enforcement officer. I worked in Her Majesty's Customs and NXI for 20 years. I was a law enforcement officer for 10 years. This isn't an unfamiliar world to me. The idea that my colleagues are facing this is just remarkable. Mr Gerard, um, just if we take the example of one of your colleagues working in one of the stores going through the experience that you've just described, what does the co-op do about it? Oh, um, we have a, we, we take, our, our view is that keeping colleagues safe is, is our first priority and it's our response, responsibility. 
depending on what happens. So, for example, you know, I, you know, every day, hundreds of my colleagues will will be abused and threatened. We we spend money to keep the, the colleagues safe in the store. We spend four times the set to average to keep colleagues safe in the store. If an incident happens, <coughs> if an incident happens, then we take a number of measures. The colleague will be looked after. They'll get counselling. They'll have time off as they need it. If, if, if we will increase the security we need into that store, we will close the store. We will do whatever we need to do to keep colleagues safe, because stock can stock can be replaced. Colleagues can. I, I, I'm very grateful for that, and the figures are alarming. If you really are saying 400 colleagues a day are abused at some hundreds level, of, hundreds of colleagues are abused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean that that is that is really concerning. But the interesting thing is, nothing in what you answered to my question about what does the co-op do made any reference to reporting this to the police. Ah, right. So, so the co-op, um, we will report all serious levels of crime. Um, right. I, I just want to be clear. What definition of serious is here? A, a colleague point. threatened. So, if a colleague is threatened, that will invariably be reported to the police. There is an interesting question. I'm sure the committee will come to this about the relationship between the reporting of crime to the police and the police response. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we need to be clear, um, and, and Emily referred to this. Police data in this area is pretty poor. Mm -hmm. Okay, we did a freedom of information request um, last year of all the police forces and what that told us is that when we report a crime, violence, abuse, large scale theft, the police in Q1 2023 did not turn up in 70% of occasions. L let me give you an example, one of my colleagues not very far from this place was suffering armed robbery, three masked men co coming in, jumping behind the kiosk with knives. She's reporting it to the, to the police. The last time she reported it she was told by the police, look, um, are they still in the store? No. In that case, don't ring again, just ring 101. 101 is the non-emergency number for an armed robbery. So we absolutely do, do report, but there, there was a point, and I think, think things have changed, we may come on to this. If the police are not turning up, the confidence that my colleagues have to report incidents to the police diminishes, and their willingness to, to do so diminishes as well. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you <coughs> one last that, if, 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 I may, if I may, and then I'll be quiet. Um, <laughs> We deploy undercover guards who are highly trained through our security con contractor and they oper operate undercover and they will apprehend individuals in store who are attacking colleagues or large scale theft. They will then detain them, make a citizen's arrest and call, and call the police. Up until October last year, even though we had the individual in our custody, the police did not turn up to complete that arrest in 80% of occasions. That means we let the individual go. Now, things have changed, and I hope I'll be able to do that, because I think, I think you've heard from Chief Constable Blakeman, who I think has made a real difference in this space. But I guess my point, the question is, do we report it? Yes, we do. Do co have colleagues for a long time felt confident it will do any good? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, cl clearly uh, that's uh, very disturbing, and it would be enormously helpful to the committee. You've given the example of being advised to ring 111 for a, for an armed robbery and so on, which I, we're, we're all horrified about. Pleased to hear you say there have been some improvements subsequently, uh, but 80% of cases where you've got somebody actually you've apprehended and the police are not turning up clearly, uh, extraordinarily disturbing. If there are more examples of, like that, it would clearly mm. be very helpful to the committee <coughs> to have that and be very grateful for it. I'm going to move on, if I can, because time is pressing, to Lord Henley. Um, first, Taylor, um, can we go back to the Retail Crime Action Plan and could you explain the key findings and recommendations of your recent research, including the research commissioned by the uh, Co-op about how retail crime is affecting businesses. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so I'll speak mostly in reference to a report that I published in January um, entitled Stealing with Impunity, um, which outlines what I argue has effectively been the decriminalisation of shop theft um, in recent years. But I'll also draw upon other um, research um, reports that I've produced, which I've submitted to the committee. The two main impacts, Paul has already spoken to some of these, um, but in terms of the effect upon businesses, the first and foremost absolutely has to be um, the impact on staff um, welfare, 
their physical welfare, but also their mental health. In 2019, I launched a report entitled It's Not Part of the Job, which documented escalating violence and verbal abuse and hate-motivated crimes directed at shop workers um, in the <coughs> UK. When I launched that report in the House of Commons, I talked to how shocked I was to the level of violence that was being um, experienced, but also its relatively hidden nature, because it was hidden behind this vernacular of shoplifting, as we've um, described already. Now, some of these attacks are physical and, and severe, and in some cases can have fatal consequences. But the report also revealed the cumulative harm of experiencing aggression, threats, um, and also being um, witness to high levels of crime, whether that's somebody just coming in and repeatedly stealing with impunity and seemingly with very little consequences. So I documented the panic attacks, the anxiety, even the post-traumatic stress disorder that some staff were experiencing simply by trying to serve their communities um, in some of these hardest hit stores. Now the main trigger for those violent attacks is somebody stealing, but there are other flashpoints as well in terms of selling um, regulated or licensed products. Alcohol, for example, can be a key trigger if somebody's already inebri inebriated. It's illegal to then serve them with additional alcohol or to deny sales to underage individuals. But sometimes, sadly, there appears to be no trigger at all, um, and shop workers are just bearing the brunt of the social issues that I've already outlined. The BRC, the British Retail Consortium, estimate 1,300 incidents a day against shop mm. workers currently. It clearly is quite shocking. The second main um, impact on businesses, aside from the challenge to operate safely, is the difficulty in some locations to operate profitably. Nearly £2 billion was lost to customer theft last year, almost double the previous year. This is an issue that is escalating in severity. And add to that the cost of crime prevention and security, some businesses are just simply no longer viable. So we're seeing some stores permanently close, and that in itself is of concern. We know the high street is already struggling, but we're also seeing the emergence of food deserts in some more remote locations. And a food desert is defined as where members of a community cannot access fresh food, medicines, toiletries at an affordable price within a reasonable distance. Um, and we also know, as an extension of that, that boarded-up shops go on to attract antisocial behaviour um, and create a downward spiral for those communities. So they're the main um, issues that I've identified that affect businesses. Of course, there are other um, more peripheral um, impacts. <coughs> The report that I mentioned, Stealing with Impunity, published earlier this year, laid out a 10-point action plan. It's got 10 key recommendations that span legis legislative changes, recommendations for policing, recommendations for the courts and sentencing, um, and I'll just pull out some of those rather than go through all 10. In terms of legislation, I've already spoken to Section 176 of the ASB Crime and Policing Act 2014. Mm -hmm. I do believe that that needs to be repealed, and I was um, delighted to see that that has been um, committed to in the King's speech earlier this year. Secondly, was the introduction of a standalone offence um, for assaulting a shop worker who is performing their duty serving the community. Again, I believe that has been committed to by the current yeah, government. Yeah. In terms of the stolen goods markets, which I've referenced before, we spend a huge amount of time focusing on the individual who commits the theft and far less thinking about where those billions of pounds of goods mm -hmm. are actually ending up. We know some of this is criminal ex exploitation, so the scenario that I painted before of the woman essentially employing a vulnerable drug addicted offender to steal on her behalf, I believe would count as criminal exploitation. So we need more regulation of e-commerce online marketplaces. People can operate fairly invisibly on those using fake names, fake addresses. We really need to... Um, uh, encourage the e-commerce sites to take better action and there's 
ready examples from other countries, I reference the USA and their Informed Consumers Act, where they've taken action to disrupt those established stolen goods markets. In addition um, to that, I do think we need to look to um, the Retail Crime Action Plan. It's certainly a step in the right direction, but when you drill down into that action plan, it's very difficult to actually measure police forces' um, uh, sort of success or, or, or the way that they're operating within that action <coughs> plan. There has been some audits, but they're timely and consuming because of the way that these crimes are recorded. Sometimes they're very difficult um, to actually measure performance. So I know we've talked about whether the police attend a violent attack on a shop worker. Currently, it's almost impossible for the police to identify that that attack took place on a retail premises. So I make recommendations on how we can bring that visibility to the fore in <coughs> order to be able to then monitor um, the KPIs under the Retail Crime Action Plan. I'll just draw your attention to one more recommendation. Sorry, I'm aware that it is yeah, quite we'll a, um, a, a drawn-out one. I really believe, in terms of police recorded crime, that if we were, if retailers did report all of those estimated 17 million incidents, well, that quadruples police recorded crime overnight. I don't believe that that is necessarily the right answer. We can look to another high volume crime type, fraud, and how that has been dealt with in the past. They established a, um, uh, the Fraud Intelligence Bureau back in 2006. And I think similar structures could be put in place for the reporting and triaging of retail crimes by um, replicating that and creating a national retail crime intelligence bureau. You, uh, go on, Lord Henley. Well, I, I just very quick question. Uh, you, you talk about a new offence of assaulting a shop worker. Mm -hmm. Why would that make a difference? I mean, assaulting a shop worker is an offence anyway. That's absolutely right. I think some of some law sometimes can be symbolic. Mm -hmm. I think it sends a clear message to shop workers that they should have the confidence to report. We know that underreporting is is such an issue. It also removes the um, facade of, of shoplifting because it's then its own standalone offence. Um, so I think it would encourage not only victims to come forward, but sends a clear message to perpetrators that this behaviour will not be tolerated. I mean, frankly, I mean, I'm really grateful Lord Henley did that follow-up, but I mean, frankly, um, it would seem certainly to me uh, I wonder if you'd agree that there's very little point in doing this symbolism uh, as you rightly described it. Uh, it's hardly going to give confidence to a shop worker to come forward if 80% of the cases where somebody's actually been apprehended in a shop, so the definition of where it took place is clear, uh, there's witnesses to what's happened and, and the police are not even turning up. But um, uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think there's a couple of points here, if I may. We should come back to the 80% figure because it's improved since the retail crime act point significantly. On does it make a difference, a really, really good question. I gave evidence to the Scottish Parliament four years ago now. They have had a standalone offence in Scotland since 2022. Um, as a result of that, the response rate in Scotland to crimes of violence against shop workers are six times what the response rate is here. So, in Scotland, 60% of reported incidents of violence against a shop worker result in an arrest. In England and Wales, it's less than 10%. That's so it works. Helpful. It works. Just a short question for the professor. Um, rob uh, theft, coupled with violence or the threat of violence is robbery, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if it's robbery, the sentence is very severe. I can't remember now, but it is high. Yes, you're yeah, absolutely. And, and, and mm -hmm. if the police charged every time with robbery, <laughs> where there is the threat of violence, that might have quite an impact. You don't need to be special offences for shop workers. It's robbery. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, and I think there is at times that confusion um, around whether a crime is a theft, a burglary, a robbery, and I think sometimes it's how the call hander potentially hears it. Where where are you? I'm in the co-op. Oh, it's a shoplifting incident, mm -hmm. and then in, and then immediately going back to that sort of connotations of shop theft. Oh, it's somebody. <coughs> to the but you're absolutely right. It is. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, I'm going to move on to Baroness Prashar. 
Yes. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, Professor Taylor and uh, Mr. Gerard. My question is really about partnerships. Um, as you're probably aware, that there have been long-standing partnerships involving retailers and others, uh, which have been established to combat uh, retail crime. What type of partnerships have been most successful, and what have made them so successful? Um, if I take that first Baroness Prapasha, I'm sure Emily can add to it. Um, <clears throat> so I said before that our view in the core is that the responsibility to keep shops and shop workers safe is for the shop, is, is for the business. That's the first priority. That's the first responsibility. The reality is businesses can't fix this on their own and nor can the police fix this on their own, which is why partnerships are so important. Um, <coughs> we've, talk, we've talked about Operation Pegasus for organised crime groups and the co-op is one of the funders of Operation Pegasus. We have, though, in addition to that, 13 different partnerships across the UK with different police forces in different regions. And what we see in those is that working together, where the co-op can share intelligence and information, both reporting and non-reported non incidents, with, with the police, allows them to target. Because, of course, the individuals, these repeat offenders that, that Emmeline described, aren't just targeting shops. They'll be involved in other um, activities activity which the police are interested in. We first started this about four years ago with Operation Synergy in Nottinghamshire, where we provided all our risk information and reported in information to the police in packages. They worked through that and identified hotspots and then pursued uh, those, those individuals. That was the basis of the 13 partnerships we now have. Um, we work with the MBCS and we also work with the Safer Business... Right, Oh, I'm sorry, the National Crime Business Solutions Organisation and also the Safer Business Network. I believe the next panel includes the director of that. What I would say is that what we've seen then over the last um, 12 to 18 months is the willingness of the police to engage in those partnerships shift significantly. Since the Retail Crime Action Plan in particular and the work that uh, Chief Constable Blankman has done, I think that has now shifted it. So if I look at our partnerships over the, last, over the first seven months of this year, we are looking at a 200% increase in the number of offenders that the police have managed. We're looking at a 250% increase in prison sentences, and I can provide all this information to the to the committee. Um, I think the, I think what we see now is that partnerships work because the police are more interested. That 80% figure we see is horrific. The figure since October 2023, when we have someone detained in our stores and we ring for police support. The police are now turning up 60% of times. So it was 20% turnout, 80% not. It's now 65% actually. And I think when you have the police wanting to be involved and wanting to tackle the issues, and you have businesses, you then can get the kind of partnerships that the co-ops got. And I think the one other call I would make, police, yep. The businesses, yes. Where BCRPs work really well, Business crime reduction partnerships work really well. I can think of Leeds or Southampton, so with West Yorkshire and, and, and Hampshire Police, where you have those people involved, helping the, the police understand our, understand our data, helping us package it for them. That's where you get fantastic a, a, outcomes, where you get offenders targeted, offenders managed. And actually what comes out could be prison sentences, but actually it could be rehab. It could be um, restorative justice. There's a range of measures that can be taken, but the police have got to turn up. They're now turning up, and they're working with us in those partnerships. So, Baron Special, you're absolutely right. Partnerships is how you t to tackle this, and partnerships is also how you give confidence to the retail sector to report crime. And, and thank you for agreeing to write this up in more detail. Lord Bark. Uh, just perhaps a slightly different... Uh, Professor Taylor wanted to come in first. Oh, sorry, sorry. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I chair the National Standards Board for the for Business Crime Reduction Partnerships, and I believe that they hold great promise for providing local intelligence gathering, a deterrence capacity um, on our high streets, and also a rapid response where they see vandalism, antisocial behaviour, street drinking. And so the real strength within these partnerships is that they prevent crime occurring in the first place and where they see it they then can prevent it from escalating. The, the National Standards Board has done a huge amount of work um, over the last two years to develop the, the national standards and to create a really robust accreditation scheme. 
However, that accreditation is still voluntary for BCRPs um, to go through. I'd like to see more um, commitment, perhaps from PCC, PCCs, uh, Police Crime Commissioners, um, to drive this accreditation for the BCRPs operating within their vicinities. I'd like to see them elevated and have more support. Many operate on a shoestring, shoestring despite the huge amount um, of activity um, that they perform on behalf of the retail sector, the police and the security sector. Thank you. Uh, Lord Bark, I'm going to, if much. you wouldn't mind, uh, could you just uh, leave your question to the end, because uh, we're, we're getting a bit tight for time. Baroness Pritchard, is there anything you want to come back on? All I just wanted to reiterate that if they can let us have the information we, you, you suggested, but also things that you'd like to mm. see to get the partnerships improving. I think things you were listing towards the end, uh, Professor Taylor, were very helpful. So if you can give us a bit more information on those, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Recommendations that can be included in our report in due course. Uh, Lord Tope. Yeah, sorry, uh, Pegasus. Can you explain how that... Um, is different from the other partnerships <coughs> and in, in what way it provides any added value. If I could link on to that, it's very nearly a year exactly since it was launched. How's it doing? Um, so I think, I think the key difference for Pegasus is that to the partnerships that we have, those 13, and in fact we, we launched one in, we've launched one with, with the Met last week and we've got one in Kent coming up. Um, they are specific to a geography. You know, it could be... Hampshire or it could be Leeds City Centre for West Yorkshire. Uh, I think what Pegasus does is look at those organisations, those criminal organisations that operate across uh, force boundaries and across ge 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 um, geographies and I think that's necessary. That alone won't tackle the issue, it will tackle a part of it but as, as Professor Taylor outlined, there's local single force mm -hmm. uh, groups and individuals. So I think operating across forces is, is the important part. How's it going? We were in an update meeting on Friday. We're pretty pleased with, the, with how it's going. I think there are 15 retailers, work, we're one of them who are funding it. I wouldn't want to go into too much detail at this point for reasons you can understand, but what I would say is that we have a number of cases with them that are all operating over more than 10 force boundaries <coughs> involving dozens and dozens of offenders and offences for tens and tens of thousands of pounds, and they are progressing those, and we are confident they're going to get somewhere. If they didn't do that work, I'm not sure who will be tackling those. So I think the, the difference is their ability to tackle people who work across boundaries. Because if, if you operate, you know, we are a national business. We don't operate on force boundary, um, uh, on force boundaries. So we need somewhere where they can address us across, help us across a national patch. Thanks, Paul. Um, just to pick up on in terms of how it's um, progressing, so I also sit on the steering committee for Project Pegasus. Um, it's been four months since they first began taking referrals from the retail sector um, of expected organised criminal groups that were targeting um, individual retailers. It's in the public domain. They recently um, produced um, some figures in terms of the early activity, and they've identified more than 150 individuals who are linked to organised retail crime and facilitated more than 23 arrests of what they um, define as high-harm offenders. So it clearly de demonstrates the scoping exercise that it initially set out to do has clearly revealed that there are networked organised criminal gangs that are targeting the retail sector across the UK, picking up on the earlier point from Baroness <coughs> Buscom, um, that this is seen as a soft option for some organised criminals who are playing upon the presumption that this is purely the cost of living crisis. So there's you know, a very deliberate um, targeting of the UK retail sector. Some of these individuals are from outside of the UK and targeting um, the retail sector here because it's perceived as relatively Easy. soft and lucrative. Mm. Just before we move on, just sticking on with the various schemes that we've, partnerships that we've been discussing, um, not now, but it would be, if you could very quickly tell us whether or not there are experiences internationally from which we can learn, uh, and if that is the case, if you'd be kind enough to write to us, because we don't have time to go into them in detail, but in a very quick uh, response, is there stuff happening uh, in other countries that we could learn from? 
Absolutely, yes. I think, and I think it would be beyond the um, time that we have here to outline those. Um, one of the key things, um, I guess, in terms of stolen goods, I've mentioned earlier, the Informed Consumers Act in the USA um, is showing great promise in terms of disrupting those online marketplaces for stolen goods. I think we can also look to Scotland and Australia that have introduced a standalone offence um, for attacking a shop worker whilst performing a duty. Um, so absolutely, I'm happy to write to the committee with those various um, examples. That would be very good. One of the things we're quite good at in this country, though, is facial recognition. So we turn to that, Lord Sanders. <coughs> so I should declare that I'm chair of the executive committee of the Society of Conservative Lawyers, and I practice at the bar for 45 years. Um, <coughs> what role, if any, does facial recognition camera work at the moment play, or could it usefully play, in tackling shoplifting? And there, of course, it obviously has a retrospective effect, but I wonder also if it might have a preemptive effect of identifying that there's a gang in the area. Anyway, over to you. Um, perhaps Mr. Gerard yeah, first? Uh, I do yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first from our own experience, and obviously <coughs> Emily has got much broad, broad experience. Um, so we don't use um, facial recognition in a real-time sense. So someone walks in and, and it clicks against yeah. the data. We don't use it. There are some businesses that do. We don't. And where we do use it is that when we report crime, um, we will provide evidence pack, and that will include CCTV imagery or body cam imagery or whatever it may be. Um, and that is all provided to the police. <clears throat> Our understanding is that um, it is not some police forces will take that imagery and automatically check it against the Police National Database and the Police National Computer System. I know South Wales do, 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 do that really well. We did a um, trial with the Met, but it's not common practice to, um, as I understand it, in police forces to automatically check the evidence, the, the images against the Police National Database. I think it should be. We've seen in South Wales that it really helps. Because, and, we, and we saw in when what we did with Sussex and other places. It really in what respect does it help? Sorry, because South because, Wales, what's the difference? Um, so they will automatically take the um, evidence back and any imagery and run it automatically, and they identify people. And guess what? When they identify people, yes, they, they know who that individual was in the co-op, but they'll work out that they've they, they got other interests. Um, with the, the police are interested in them for other reasons. So I think it really helps. Just the last point before, before uh, 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 Emmeline comes in is we don't use live facial recognition at the minute. We have no plans to. And the reason is that the nature of we can't really see what intervention it would drive helpfully. Because if it says to you it's somebody who's going to shoplift, well, I, we know that if a colleague goes to intervene, what's going to happen at best is abuse, but more likely will be violence. Yeah. So we don't see the helpful intervention it drives. We're not really clear. The only database that really will, will do this for you is the Police National Database, not a locally created one. So I'm not sure what database is being checked against. And the last thing is that um, if you go against the Police National Database, you could be on that for any number of reasons, none of which have got anything to do with being in, in a shop. And therefore, I think there are ethical <coughs> reasons that we'd want to think through. I will stop there. Sorry, 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 <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, I think, first of all, I mean, Paul's alluded to this, but I think it's really important just to be clear about the different types of facial recognition and how it's used. It's not a homogenous category, um, and there's different suppliers who have different algorithms, and it's applied um, yeah, in, in different ways. So, of course, you have live facial recognition, cameras that are focused on a specific area, and as people pass through that area, their image images are streamed di directly to the system and compared to a watch list. So that could be the police national database. The former policing minister suggested extending that to the passport database, which is not without controversy and would, must be uh, publicly <laughs> debated. Um, but that's how live facial recognition works, and that has been the most controversial use of it by the police and by other um, sectors. You then have retrospective facial recognition. It's used after the event um, as part of a criminal investigation, and images are typically supplied from CCTV, mobile phones, dash cams, doorbells, etc. And those images are then compared against images of people taken on arrest to identify a suspect. So again, this watch list of individuals. 
A third category is um, termed facial intelligence. And this is where you might not have a watch list or an individual has yet to be identified as suspicious or having committed um, a criminal activity. And that's useful. Um, it, it can pick up repeat visits. So if an individual thinking about the retail sector is visiting multiple boot stores all around the country but they've never been convicted, it could flag that this is an unusual type of behaviour, not typical of everyday consumers. It's also useful um, if somebody were to be planning an attack and to pick up on uh, uh, reconnaissance um, activity. So there's those three different types. In the Retail Crime Action Plan in 2023, there was a challenge by the former policing minister to, for police to double their use um, of facial recognition checks against the PND. And his intention was to radically increase um, the, the database of comparable images by drawing upon um, other databases, such as the Passport one, as I've mentioned. I think it's really important in the context of this debate um, to think about the legislative framework around facial recognition. There's no question that AI-driven biometric surveillance can be intrusive to everyday members of the public and to customers. But similarly, there's no question that this could be a very effective tool in identifying prolific, repeat and organised criminals, but it must be done ethically in a privacy-first way. I'd just like to mention that in 2023, the Digital Information and Data Protection Bill suggested removing the role of the Biometrics and Surveillance Camera Commissioner, a much needed role, I believe, at this time as we move into more surveillance and biometric um, capabilities in retail, but also more broadly in society. My recommendation is that we need a code of practice on how facial recognition can and should be used um, in various sectors. That's very helpful. I, and I'm sorry, I am going to rush us on. Uh, Lord Bark. Yeah, something perhaps a slightly different. We'll go back to the police. Um, I mean, you mentioned, Professor, the, um, uh, the effect austerity had on a number of those who commit these offences and how important an issue that was. You particularly mentioned it. Of course, austerity affected the police hugely too. Mm -hmm. The two of us here who've been police and crime commissioners actually mm -hmm. uh, and if mm -hmm. I told you the number of occasions when we've had long, uh, we had long meetings in which we discussed the issues that we've been discussing mm -hmm. this morning mm -hmm. uh, but there just is n was not the resource to mm -hmm. do as much mm -hmm. as the police wanted to. So the expression the police don't want to seems uh, not one I think used by either of you is a completely false one in my in my experience anyway they do want to and it, perhaps the slight easing in the last few years has made it easier for these schemes uh, to work better than they would uh, have had five six seven years uh, ago and I think it's important to make that yeah. point that the police suffered from austerity too mm -hmm. and had huge number of other issues that were facing them during those years. My question is, at a time, and I can see this, of course, public confidence in the police in this area is undoubtedly low, I think perhaps a little bit unfairly, but not entirely. Do policing and business partnerships have public buy-ins? Buy-in, and is it important that they should do so? Um, so Emmeline and I have done quite a lot of media on this over the last 18 months in different ways. Um, mm. I am, every time I've done media, the reaction from the public is uh, horror at what I described, as indeed the, co the committee is. They are shocked at some of the data and they think things should be done. Of course, most people will see this in shops. They will see in shops mm. the kind of behaviour that Emmeline and I have described. I don't believe there's any. I think they want the police to take action, they want businesses to take action. So I think when I describe some of the things that we've done and other retailers have done, I think the public say, yeah, and you should do as well. I guess there is a debate, and um, Emily alluded to it, is that it's how intrusive that law enforcement needs to be. And what I mean by that is that ultimately, the co is a convenience store. People come into our store and spend four or five minutes and get four or five things and, and run out. 
these have to be places that people feel comfortable coming into. They have to be people that is easy, places easy to come into to do your shopping. If we get to the point of having shops that are built like fortresses, then we we start to lose the very essence of the high street. And we and as and as um, Emily alluded to, mm. high streets are at the heart of many many communities. And those communities that are facing tough times are the ones with boarded up shops. So we need to find ways to protect those shops, businesses and the police. But I don't think my sense is that the is that the public would want us to do that because they value the role shops play in their communities. Yeah, I, I absolutely Perfect. echo um, Paul's views there in terms of the, the fortress stores, as I um, have described them. Um, you're absolutely right. In terms of the disinvestment in the police, they've been incredibly hard hit. They're overstretched, they're under-resourced. We have a more junior force now as um, you know, senior officers have, have gone on to retire and not been replaced with the um, talent um, at, at, at the same level. I think that can only really be resolved, um, I believe, through a, a, a royal commission or a commission looking into um, the police. And I've recently um, published a edited a collection of essays on the police that make similar um, recommendations. That's entitled Police in the Perma Crisis, because I believe the police have lurched from one crisis to another. However, sort of moving back, the, the boundaries have been redrawn or the parameters of policing have been redrawn and we're seeing that very clearly with um, things such as right care, right person. They're becoming much more focused in what the role of the policing um, should be. They have to do more with less. That's not going to change. And that's where I think technology will really begin to play a greater role. But I also believe it's not just about numbers. There is also a change in the operational tactics of the policing. So we've seen the removal, <coughs> removal of neighbourhood policing, for example. That's where I really believe that business crime reduction partnerships and similar initiatives can fill that void by being the eyes and ears on the streets, in the communities, intelligence gathering, and really addressing issues before they blossom. Um, and that's where I think, yeah, the public would have that buy-in because they would be able to see individuals, capable guardians is what we call them in criminology, um, to actually address these issues that are of concerns to everyday people. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm afraid we are going to have to uh, bring it to an end, but I suspect we could stay here for hours uh, <laughs> listening to both of you and learning from both of you. So huge thank you for the work that you're both doing in this area. Thank you for the evidence that you've given us today. Uh, and in particular, thank you for all the promises you've made to provide <laughs> us with more information. Um, and, and if I can just say, it would be enormously helpful to have that as quickly as possible because we have to draw this uh, inquiry to a conclusion. Uh, in so doing that, writing to us, clearly if you have thoughts about what you would hope this committee might be recommending, uh, to the current government and, and the police and everybody else interested in it, then clearly we'd be uh, very interested to read your suggested recommendations as well. But uh, I, again, thank you very much indeed. Uh, order, order. The meeting is now suspended. I'm sorry, we have to use... The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended.